Good morning and welcome to church. This is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Let's open our service in song. And as we come back together, my name is Jeremy Grenhart. I serve as music director at Christ Lutheran in Bethesda, Maryland, coming live and direct to you from my living room in Philadelphia this morning. Just wanted to offer a quick word of welcome. Old friends are welcome, and if you're new to this space, you are welcome too. Well, let's open our service with our confession and forgiveness, and you can follow along in the PDF that came along with the service. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God, and one another. We'll take a moment of silence to do this. And you can read along with me if you want. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with the power of the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Let's sing a verse of our Kyrie. Praise the Lord. Let us 
Well, before we get into the word, just wanted to light our makeshift Advent wreath here. And uh, last week was hope, and this week is peace. And I just wanted to remind us, uh, uh, as we kind of turn on the TV and all, all we see is stuff, that it is the hope that Christ brings us and the peace that Christ brings us. And also, if this is a difficult time of year for you, then Emmanuel, God is with you as well. Let's hear a psalm. A reading from Psalm 85. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. O Lord, God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. Amen. Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. Dear friends, whatever time of day it is when you are joining this service, my name is Richard Graham. I'm a retired Lutheran pastor, and I am just blessed by the opportunity to help lead these worship services for Christ Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bethesda, Maryland. We begin with a prayer. Stir up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son. By his coming, strengthen us to serve you with purified lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Gospel lesson for this worship service on this second Sunday in Advent is from the very beginning of what many scholars consider it to be the first gospel. These are the very first eight verses of the gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who, pre who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. These Advent Sundays always bring us several encounters with John the Baptist. John the Baptist, that great forerunner of our Lord Jesus, the one who acknowledges him, who proclaims his coming, who prepares other people to look forward to the Messiah, to the Savior. John the Baptist is an important figure in the Gospels, 
And we know he was an important figure in the world. Just the same way that Jesus shows up in the Roman secular historians, is referenced there by people who have no interest in him as a religious figure at all, John the Baptist also shows up in the Roman secular historians. Uh, people write about him as a political figure, actually. And we know from other places in our New Testament that there, are, that there were people scattered around not just Palestine, but the whole world, who believed that John was the Messiah. John himself was the Messiah, they believed. And if you remember what it says about John in our Gospels, John had to go to considerable lengths to disabuse people of that notion. He was not the Messiah, he said again and again and again. Who he was, was the forerunner, the prophet. And so we believe that John the Baptist is in some ways the last great figure of what we call the Old Testament. He was the last great figure in that tradition of people who brought the word of the Lord into their culture, into their society, whether the people around them always wanted to hear that or not. And we know that John the Baptist spoke truth to power in such effective ways that the powers that be put him to death. That's another gospel lesson, but John was beheaded for speaking the truth about the political leaders of his time and about the ways that they betrayed people's trust. Anyway, John the Baptist is a figure that we always hear about, but I don't know that we necessarily think about him so very much. He's a striking figure, you know, he's out there in the wilderness, sits a long way from Jerusalem to the River Jordan. John the Baptist is, is out there a long way from where most of the people of his day lived. And he's obviously living a fairly rough life. He wears camel's hair and he does just a belt around his waist. That's what it says in St. Mark's Gospel. And camel's hair is not as nice as you might think. When I was a, a, a boy, there was a man in our church back up outside of Baltimore who in the wintertime wore a camel's hair overcoat. And I always thought that was so cool, you know, that kind of light brown color, and it looked so soft. Um, camel's hair in, in, in our day makes you think of elegant stores, makes you think of Brooks Brothers or something like that, makes you think of sort of rich people who can afford to dress up in that. You know, if you have a camel's hair coat, you're a lucky man or a lucky woman. But in John's day, camel's hair was not that nice. Camel's hair in those days was just the hide of a camel, and a camel's a big animal, so it's got a lot of hide to it. And you could uh, take a piece of camel leather, tan the back, and then just cut a hole in it and wear it like a poncho. And that's apparently what John did because the gospel goes out of its way to tell us that it was held together, this poncho, just by a leather, leather belt. And apparently that's all he had for clothes. And, and that's, that's not very much. And it would have, he would have been cold in the, in the winter and hot in the summer and wet much of the time. And it says that he ate locusts and wild honey, which, trust me, is not a good diet. It's a diet of things that you could find out there. He ate food that he just happened upon. So besides being cold and then sometimes too hot and often wet, he was probably almost always hungry. And so if John the Baptist seems in the Gospels a little edgy sometimes, you can understand it's a rough life. He was a poor man, a very poor man. And in that, that respect, maybe the closest thing we see to someone like John the Baptist is the kind of person you encounter at the intersection of a busy, busy, busy highway sometimes. The guy who's standing out there with a sign just asking for help. The guy who doesn't have very nice clothes and doesn't look like he's eaten very well lately. That would have been the impression that John the Baptist made on people. Except that John the Baptist was also a fierce voice telling people they needed to clean up their lives, that the way they were living was not right with the Lord, that if they wanted to be prepared for the Messiah who was surely coming, they needed to reform themselves. They needed to accept as a sign of that public reformation the baptism that he offered, the baptism that we know that our Lord accepted from his hands, the baptism we know that our Lord transfigured so that it became the sacrament that we celebrate, the sacrament that we have accepted, holy baptism as it comes to us now. 
Anyway, John the Baptist was a rough character and a poor man, and he was the Lord's prophet. And, and the lesson here partly is this one, that not all of the Lord's people are elegant and refined and beautiful, you know? There's always news in our, in our news. I always get this on my computer feeds about the new pastor in, the, in California or New Jersey or someplace and about his million and a half dollar home and about, about the preacher's beautiful travel and about the way that, that, that some new celebrity for Christian life has, has her home in Hawaii and it costs $3 million. We, we hear a lot of that. And, and I think there's a lot that floats around in our world, too, about what they call the prosperity gospel that says that if you're really right with God, God will take care of you in every kind of financial way, and you won't have a thing to worry about. Really, you won't. The, 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 the connection between piety and prosperity is so close that, uh, you, that you just might as well pray a lot, and, and, and God will make you rich. You hear a lot of that in our culture. And then here is John the Baptist who is the great, the last great prophet, the forerunner of the Lord, the one, the first one maybe who sees the Lord Jesus and knows who he is. And here's this man out penniless and almost without clothes, certainly without much food, living all by himself out there in the wilderness. And, and, and when people come to him, most of what he does is he yells at them. He is God's person in spite of the fact that there is no prosperity that you can see in his life. He is the Lord's person in spite of all that. And maybe, dear friends, because of all that. It's possible that because John the Baptist leads such a radically simplified life, it's possible that he hears God a little more clearly than other people. Anyway, the lesson here for us is, is pretty clear, and I don't think you need me to explain this to you very much. We certainly live in a place, in a city, in a big metropolitan area where wealth and power are both, are both conspicuous and, and very much appreciated. I used to have an office that had a window on Connecticut Avenue and we knew what time of the morning the cavalcade of black sedans and black SUVs would roll down Connecticut Avenue from the observatory up the street toward the, the, the offices down by the White House carrying the vice president. We were so excited that we could just look out the window and see this big mess of cars and SUVs and we could think the vice president of the United States is in one of those and we are, we are here looking at that. Every now and then if it was a pretty day we would go down on the sidewalk and stand and watch and see if we could pick out the car. We live in that kind of a place, you know, we live in a place where the assumption is that, that power is obvious and that riches should be obvious. We live in a place where people think if you have it, flaunt it, you know? But then there's John the Baptist. Then there's John the Baptist, who is the closest thing we know to, to eyes on the Lord. And he has little or nothing except the power of God within him to identify the Savior when he sees him. And of course, that savior whom he identifies is not himself, either a rich man or a man of great power as the world counts this. Jesus says he doesn't even have a house. He has a house that he shares up in Capernaum with Peter and Peter's family. He doesn't have his own house. He doesn't really have a family that takes good care of him. He's a wandering teacher. And in the end, he's so powerless that the Romans can put him to death. And it's almost like eh, nobody much cares, you know? But the power that he unleashes in the world, the power that he gives his people to follow him, is the power to follow him in any circumstances, to be his people no matter what. If we're safe and comfortable and even wealthy, good for us. We can use that. And if we're poor and in trouble, good for us. We can use that too. In these pandemic days, lots of people around us feel very powerless. They feel like, who am I if I can't go to work in my nice office? Who am I if I can't go to lunch with my friends in my nice restaurant? 
Who am I if I can't like walk around the street and chat up the neighbors and go in for tea? Who am I if I really am stripped of everything I took for granted about myself just because of this dumb virus? And the answer to that who am I question is, you are a child of God. The baptism of our Lord Jesus fell upon you. You are set free from your sins and from your own self to be God's person in the world. So be that whatever your circumstances. If you have nice clothes, if you have a good place to live, enjoy them and find some way to make, to have those things make you strong for other people. And if all you have is a camel hair coat and not one from Brooks Brothers, then use that too. Let that also make you strong in the Lord's service. This is a blessed Advent season. It gives us lots and lots to think about. May you think in these days about how much God loves you and about how much God is making you into the Christ for your neighbors, as Luther said. Be Christ for your neighbors, for your family members, for your friends. And let the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, now and forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Graham. Let's sing together again and then move into the prayers of the people.
Good morning, church. My name is Taylor Lee, and I serve as one of the worship leaders here at Christ Evangelical Lutheran Church, and I invite you into our time for the prayers of the people. This is a special time in our service in which we bring the concerns and the celebrations of our hearts and minds to God. As we come together in prayer, we ask you to take a position of prayer that best suits you in your space. For our world. We enter in the second week of Advent, which represents peace. We celebrate the peace in which comes with Christ entering into the world for our redemption. John chapter 13 verse 6 reminds us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Lord, you gave us Jesus, the Prince of Peace, to usher us into a new age of redemption for all your people. Right now, our world desperately needs the peace and love that Jesus represents. We play for places around the world in which the sins of violence, poverty, or lack of democracy exist. Allow softened hearts among global leaders, resolution of outstanding political conflict, and positive connection between more nations. Allow peace on earth and goodwill towards men to not only be a novelty Christmas saying, but to be a reality in our world. We continue to pray for our world as we fight against COVID-19. We are fighting against time to find a vaccine for the entire world as this pandemic has changed our lives. We pray in thanksgiving for our healthcare workers and hospitals, public health officials, and government officials all around the world. Let our governing bodies work together to create guidance that is effective and productive in keeping our citizens safe. With all things considered, we thank you, Lord, for being a great healer, as we know the world is ultimately in your hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear a song. Shower the people you love with love. Open your heart in prayer. Shower the people you love with love. Open your heart in prayer. Our community. This current season, season should be a time of happiness and excitement. However, many of us in our communities are struggling with the heaviness of life. As the pandemic continues, there's a great uncertainty about who will receive the vaccine, when it will arrive in our hospitals or clinics, and will the vaccine be enough to eradicate the coronavirus as we know it. We're also trying to prepare for a holiday season that feels different for some of these very same reasons. While we are uh, preparing gifts and making decisions for holiday gatherings, help us to remember the true meaning of this time. The coming of Christ represents the word made flesh for us. You've promised rest for the weary, victory for all battles, and love and comfort for the brokenhearted. We need your love and peace now more than ever. And we thank you, Lord, for being our joy. With those, prom those powerful promises in mind, help us to know that you are with us not just now, but all year round. Thank you, Jesus. One of the beautiful things about having community is the sense of companionship and a sense of belonging. In the past few months, this blessing has been more difficult to achieve with stay-at-home orders and quarantine guidances in place. With, for those feeling a sense of loneliness, tension, and or anxiety during this time, we ask our Lord to guide you through our new realities, foster more opportunities for fellowship safely, and provide wisdom as we go into the places that you call us. Lord, in your mercy, Hear us all. Shower the people you love with love. Open your heart in prayer. Shower the people you love with love. Open your heart in prayer. For our church, we can make many plans, but God, you hold the ultimate plan for us. As we are excited for what you have planned for our ministry through Advent and beyond, we help us to hear your voice more clearly, individually to prepare for, prepare for the coming of Christ and protect our congregation and bring a spiritual renewal that promotes growth, development, peace, and community that will bring glory to your name. Bless our church leaders and help them to guide our congregation. As you have brought hope into the world, let us be a mirror of you and bring that message of hope to others. We are blessed to have the means to connect with each other through this virtual worship experience. Continue to grow the ways in which we make disciples. 
We thank you for our reader, Ajilta, Pastor Graham, for our message today, our organizers, editors, musicians, those who share our service with family and friends, and all others who put forth a labor of love to bring our workmanship experience to more homes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our song. Shower the people you love with love. Open your heart in prayer. Shower the people you love with love. Open your heart in prayer. For our people, help us to become the best versions of ourselves, Lord. Allow this time of Advent to be a meaningful period of reflection and fill us with a deep sense of what your vision of peace looks like within ourselves. You lovingly created each and every one of us with purpose. If we are struggling for any reason this week, remind us next week that the peace that surpasses all understanding is that you provide. We pray for those for whom this holiday season is difficult. We pray especially for those coping with mental illness, addiction, loss of relationships, loss of family or friends, um, or financial difficulties. We thank you in advance, Lord, for covering us in the midst of our own personal storms. Thank you for bringing hope into our world and showing us what you can conquer or what we can conquer through our difficulties with you. We pray for those who struggle with the loss of family or friend member, our family or friend or family member. May God offer you comfort during this difficult time. We pray that a community of family and friends surrounds you and reminds you that you are loved and supported. We now open up the virtual, the virtual spiritual space for the prayers of people. Feel free to take this moment to offer any prayers you might have aloud or silently up to God. In your mercy, hear us all. Shower the people you love with love. Open your heart in prayer. Shower the people you love with love. Open your heart in prayer. We place all of these prayers, the ones we haven't prayed yet, in the silent meditations of our hearts at the foot of the cross. And we pray in Jesus' holy name and the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Let the church say, Amen. Well, thanks, Taylor. And if you have prayer requests, please feel free to just kind of drop a comment below or you can hit me up or anyone on the cool council and we would be happy to be praying for you. Also, if you're interested in the ways that you can engage the ministry, you're going to want to take two minutes and just go to ChristLutheranBethesda.org and there you can find what we're up to and, and also be able to be in contact with us. Let's sing together one more time.
People of God, please receive this benediction. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.